Thank you very much. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending this session for the first time in, in history. This is a completely new uh, conference, and I'm, I'm super happy to be able to present. I was kind of concerned when I, I uh, saw that I was accepted for the US part of, of uh, the Data Platform Discovery Day because I'm in Europe and there's a few hours between us. But it turned out that it it's perfect. It's 9 a.m. for, for uh, the most of the US people and it's 3 p.m. for me. So I'm more than happy to go for that. Let's go for Azure Machine Learning for the absolute beginner. And as it says on the tin, it is geared toward the absolute beginner. If you have any uh, knowledge with um, machine learning and all that kind of stuff, uh, I'm not going to say that you're going to be disappointed, but it's not going to be very deep. And I'm, I'm talking more about concepts than specific implementations. Having said that, I'm going to show you a few nifty tri uh, tricks as well. So let's start. Would you say that machine learning would cure cancer? No. It's like saying a hammer or a screwdriver will build a house. Would machine learning be one of the tools we use to cure cancer? Oh yeah, that I absolutely believe. That's also a key concept when it comes to any machine learning journey. Machine learning is a tool like any other tool, a powerful tool, but still only a tool. The tool is pretty much useless on its own, and it's up to the artisan wielding the tool to use it to its full potential. We're going to go through what the heck is machine learning? What, what, what is it? What does it do? We're going to see how do we get started with machine learning in Azure, because you can do machine learning in, in pretty much any cloud today or on-prem if you so like, but we're talking about Azure here. We're also going to be looking at how to apply machine learning concepts in reality. I'm going to show you some examples where you may or may not think you would find machine learning. So this is going to be an overview because machine learning is, is popping up pretty much everywhere. And it is with machine learning as with any new hype. Take blockchain or, or cryptocurrencies, for example. Everyone was talking about them as it was the solution to all our problems. It turns out it wasn't, simply because they are also only tools. It's all about learning what the tool can do and then apply the tool to the problems it can conceivably help with. My goal is to give you an overview of what this tool can and cannot do and get you on your way to start learning and leveraging how to benefit you in solving your problems. My name is Alexander. I am from Sweden. It is currently raining in Sweden, which is kind of always going to happen. I'm a principal solutions architect at a company called Datea. Uh, it's the best title I've ever had because nobody knows what I do. I am basically running around the Nordic countries. Datea is, is a Nordic company. Uh, helping people with data. And I, I usually say that I, I make data matter because only data that matters can influence any change. I'm a data platform MVP. I'm a speaker. I try to blog. I have a podcast known as Knee Deep in Tech, and I did a Pluralsight course on Power BI. It was actually relevant for all of two weeks. Then parts of Power BI changed. I am not at all bitter, but it's a fun course. So what is machine learning? Well, according to Wikipedia, machine learning is the scientific study of algorithms and statistical models that computer systems use to progressively improve performance for a specific task. Say what now? OK, right. So algorithms, statistical models progressively improve. OK. We're starting to get a, a grasp of what this is about. It's apparently something mathematical and we're doing something progressively. If we keep looking at Wikipedia, we're going to find that machine learning algorithms build a mathematical model of, a sam of sample data known as training data in order to make predictions or decisions without being explicitly programmed to perform the task. Dude, uh, are you confused yet? Because I kind of am. And at the end of the day, it's a heck of a lot of buttons and knobs to turn. So let's step away from the definition and look at a, an example instead. Most of you have probably gone to school. 
not everyone, but most. And in school, we were generally fed. If it is a good school, you get fed. And let's just say that we go to a cafeteria at a school and we put in a set of scales, probably slightly more advanced set of scales than this. And this specific scale can actually measure something and instantly upload it into Azure. So it's basically got an RJ, RJ45 checking in the back. And whenever a student picks up a, um, his, his or her food, you measure before they start eating and you measure when they have eaten. This means that you know how much food has been consumed, right? And then you start add in properties to this. Let's go for the, uh, the calendar. We know, for instance, that on a Tuesday, we eat a lot more food than on a Friday for some reason. And in March, it's going to be less food than in January. Just taking as example. And we keep going. I mean, we can add stuff like weather. We can go for demographics. We can go for um, schedule. We can go for um, basically anything you want to add to this mix. And when you're done, you have a data set that you can train a machine learning algorithm on, and you're going to get a prediction on what is the optimum food on a Tuesday in this specific neighborhood. It is raining outside, and they just had math. Then you're going to get a, a result. Trouble is, Maybe a lot of you guys have, have uh, kids, and anyone who has kids would answer a resounding yes to the question, do kids generally like chocolate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What happens if we were to introduce chocolate to this mix? What would be the optimum food? Yes, chocolate, because the kids are going to eat the chocolate and ignore basically anything else. I mean, who wants to eat tomatoes if you have chocolate? And this is one of the key tenets of machine learning. You're not going to get the, the optimum or the best um, food in this case. You're going to get the food that, it, uh, according to the algorithm, is going to be the optimum things. It's not going to be the right food. It's going to be the most eaten food. What can we learn or infer from this? Machine learning does not do any judgment. It doesn't interpret anything. It's just going to serve you up whatever it thinks is the best one. And it's up to you as the user or anybody basically working with this to have some sanity into it because we do not have sanity built in. So what are we actually doing? We are using statistical models to find patterns in the data, and we are trying to predict outcomes where we do not have a data. So that's why we can use some of the data, like um, date, um, geographic area, temperature, and so on and so forth, and extrapolate a result. Will that mean that I can get a completely new menu? Well, <laughs> The basic answer is no, you can't, because that's the way the algorithm works in this example. The uh, somewhat more advanced answer that this primary will not cover is, of course, you can get some very interesting recipes. Again, the AI or the machine learning does not have a clue of what it's actually doing. So it can come up with these amazing um, foods like creme grunk garlic cheese, please. Who wouldn't want to have that? Or busy mist or out of meat, completely meat circle, artichoke gelatin dogs. This is a, um, a machine learning algorithm created by Janelle Shane, a research scientist that works with um, machine learning um, stuff. And you can Google machine learning or AI and paint names, and you're going to be falling all over yourself because it is absolutely hilarious. So how does it work? And I generally ask people, 
if they know where I took this picture? And the answer is actually Tokyo. And you could probably do a lot of money as, as a, a uh, an electrician or telephone repairman in, in Tokyo because, oh boy, it's like the um, water pipes on British British buildings. They're always on the outside of the building, so it's easier to get to them when they freeze. Being from a Nordic country where we have a lot colder temperatures, we just go, you're strange in the UA, you, you, in the UK. So how does it work? Well, it depends on a few things. We're gonna to need to add two key definitions. We're gonna be talking about a model for, for starters. So what is a model? Well, the model is the mathematical representation of a real world process. To generate a machine learning model, you will need to provide training data to a machine learning algorithm to learn from. So the question becomes instantly, which algorithm is the best? Well, I am sorry to say that there is no such thing as the best algorithms. It all depends on what kind of machine learning you're doing and what kind of problem you're trying to solve. There are basically three kinds of machine learning. We have the supervised learning. Uh, this is gonna be a, a bit abstract, but um, bear with me. We have supervised learning, which in turn gets uh, put into three different categories. That's going to be the classification, the regression, and the anomaly detection. Classification is basically where you um, decide on, are we going to go category A or category B? Regression is where we're predicting something. They are pretty similar for, for starters. And anomaly detection is completely different. Anomaly detection works basically like this. I'm a bit of a Star Wars fan, and some of you might have seen my, my T-shirt. Yes, I have a lot of Star Wars paraphernalia and, and a few tattoos as well. I went to Star Wars Celebration, a 40,000 Star Wars fans convention in Chicago last year. It was amazing. And I was trying to buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks, and I swiped my card, and it was declined. And I mean, come on, my card is never declined. And as I was pondering this very strange conundrum, my phone rang. And being like anybody else in this day and age, I picked up my phone and looked at it and realized that it was a Swedish number. And it was basically in the middle of the night in Sweden. So I picked it up and went, yeah, hello. Oh, hi, uh, this is your bank calling. Uh, we see that you are in the sh in in in, um, in Chicago and um, trying to buy a cup of coffee. Is that correct? And completely dumbfounded, I go, yeah, yeah, it, it's a latte. It's it's really good. Oh, good, super. We just wanted to make sure because our system flagged this as an anomaly because you're usually in the U.S. or in in the West Coast of the U.S. when you are in the U.S., which is true because I usually I frequent Microsoft. So that's what the anomaly detection is. It's all about finding outliers, finding something strange. So that, that's the way the supervised learning thing uh, works. And when it comes to choosing the algorithm, um, there is, for instance, a cheat sheet that you can start with. If you wanna go for a regression, you have a lot of different kinds of regression um, algorithms, or if you want to go for two-class or multi-class classifications, you have a few of those as well. This is where you find your pet data scientist and sit them down and go, please explain these to me. I want to see them try because they're going to be sweating. Even the most experienced data scientists are not going to be able to go for the right algorithm every time. It's all about changing things around, trial and error, and trying new ideas. But this is a good starting point. If you want to do a regression and you have a small data set and a linear model, maybe a Bayesian linear regression is a good starting point. Keyword being starting point. Then we have unsupervised learning. And that's kind of what happens in every uh, kindergarten in, in the, the world. The uh, unsupervised learning is not so much where you explain what you want to do. 
is more like you explain this is what I want you to achieve and just find a way to get there. I'm going to give you three examples. In the first example, they did a, um, an algorithm to landing an airplane in a flight simulator. Anybody who is a pilot knows that it's the landing that it's the most exciting part because if you screw that up, well, you might not need to fly anymore. Um, so what did the algorithm do? Well, it exploited an overflow error in the physics simulator and created large enough forces that turned out to be zero, so the result was a perfect score. In this case, the reward shaping, as it's called, where you uh, try to steer the algorithm was you should create a, a perfect landing. And well, it did exactly as it was asked. It created a perfect score. Moving on to Tetris, I mean, how how hard can it be to teach something to play Tetris? Well, the reward shaping in this case was avoid losing. So it paused the game. Because when the game is paused, it cannot, by definition, lose. Are you starting to see a pattern here? Mm -hmm. And of course, you can always look at another example where they try to teach it to ride a bike. And the reward shaping in this case was for not falling over and making progress toward a goal point. That should probably mean that it could teach itself to ride a bike, right? Well, it, it started to ride a circle around the goal in a physically stable loop because it's not falling over and it is making progress toward a goal. And since it was not punished from moving away from the goal, it said that, yeah, this is a good way of doing it. So this is like, I have a friend. He is absolutely brilliant. He has a gazillion in IQ. Unfortunately, he is very, very severely autistic. And if I were to ask him, can you open the window? He's going to look at me as if I'm stupid and, and say, yes. Of course I can open the window and then he'll turn back to whatever he was doing. And that's exactly the way that machine learning works. You're going to get exactly what you ask for. Nothing more and nothing less. Then we have what's known as reinforcement learning. We don't have this in Azure yet. Um, I've, I've talked to a few people that know much more about this than I do and they say that reinforcement learning is, is coming and you can kind of sort of do it through Databricks, but you can't do it in Machine Learning Studio right this moment. It's, it's kind of a combination between supervised learning and unsupervised, uh, more like uh, best of both worlds, if you will. So let's break this down. What is training data? I am so happy you asked. What is training data? Well, it can basically, basically be anything you want. Anything you think can have an impact on a given question is considered data, and thus it can be used as training data for a model. The quality of this data is paramount, though. The data can only work with the data you put in, and the old adage of garbage in, garbage out is very, very applicable here. So what about this quality crap? What does quality mean? Well, this is a very interesting conversation in and of its own. We could probably spend hours just discussing what is quality. And in a word, quality means everything, absolutely everything. But depending on who you're talking to, quality will mean different things. I come from a data or, or database background. For me, quality means that I do not have any inconsistencies with the data type. I don't have any null values, all that kind of stuff. It has nothing to do with business data for me. It's all about the technical storage of the data. If you were to talk to a financial analyst, they're going to say that quality means that all the, the numbers line up. You have um, lineage for all the numbers. You know exactly where they came from. You know exactly where they go. The cost centers, all that stuff is, is perfect. That's quality for them. Does that mean that my quality is more important than their quality? No, but we need to take into account the whole picture. 
The data must be clean and it must be correct for the model to A, accept it, and B, be able to learn from it. Consistency is absolutely key. And well, as every parent knows, it's very important to be consistent in raising kids. And let's keep going with that analogy for a second and, and think about it. The um, think, think about, uh, let me rephrase, think outside the box is what I'm trying to say. The more variations and situations the model or kid is shown, the easier it is to find a pattern to apply this new knowledge because that's again what we're doing. We are looking for a pattern and this pattern will govern how we move forward. The funny thing is that the human mind is exceptionally good at finding patterns, even where there are no patterns. And if the human mind is good at finding patterns where there are no patterns, a computer can screw things up much, much more. And that kind of drives us into how much data do we need? Well, that's easy. Way, way more than most people think. You can't really have too much data to train your model as the predictive capability of the model is directly related to the amount and the quality of the data you show it. The more data you feed it, the more it needs to chew. And chewing in this case means compute power. And that's going to be, that means money, right? It's, it's going to be costing you money. But from a technical and a quality standpoint, the more data you put in, the better. Definitely the better. And here's the kicker. Do I need to be familiar with my data? Oh, heck you do. You definitely do. A couple of reasons. You might find yourself in a situation where the data um, is showing, you, you think that the data is showing you something that it isn't. I'm gonna give you an example in just a second. But there's also the, the issue of the human mind. Because if you were to show a, a person something one time and it behaves exactly the same the second time, then a pattern is already locked in and they will be expecting that thing to work or behave the third time or the fourth time. So this is why it's so easy to manipulate people. Just give them something they want to see a few times and then you can start screwing with it and they will not even notice. This is AI light because this is a, an, a Power BI visual known as the key influencers visual. I use this on a heart disease data, data set and basically said, give me the driver for heart disease, where heart disease is detected to be yes. And as you can see, the gender is male. That's going to give you a 2.15 times increased likelihood of heart disease. Does this mean, mean that as a male, I am 2.15 times more likely to have a heart attack? No. This is where people get confused. And there are a couple of reasons for that. So I was a paramedic. I'm still a qualified paramedic, I might add. And I, I'm not that versed in, in um, cardiology, but I, I know emergency medicine. And I also know how it works with treatment and how it works with designing new treatment modalities. Because at the end of the day, about 90% of all the research is done on males. And a female will present in a vastly different way than a, um, a male when it comes to uh, signs of heart disease. So knowing that the data is probably pretty heavily skewed towards males, suddenly this 2.15 times is starting to look somewhat more reasonable. And this is something that you cannot infer from the data itself. You need to know the context. You need to know what the data looks like. You need to know how to interpret the data. Again, it's a tool. And don't just buy whatever it shows you apply some sanity. Most of us working in IT have a, a very limited amount of sanity, but use the sanity wisely. 
in essence, machine learning can be a bit of a black box. Yeah. So how does it work? Well, let's see if we can make it behave in a way that we want it to. The steps that we need to take are, we need to get some data. And this can be from basically anywhere. It can be text files. You can put it in, in the data lake. You can scrape data from the internet. Um, basically any kind of data you want, you can use. Then we clean the data. And in this case, again, cleaning means that we need to uh, figure out that it's consistent, that it is uh, correct in every sense of the word, depending on how we define correct and so on and so forth. When we are sure that the data set is usable, then we can start training the model. This is where we show the model parts of the data, not all of it. We're gonna withhold the part of the data. That's gonna be where it used as evaluation data. We're gonna show it like 75 or 50% of the data and go, look at this, find me patterns. And when it's been chewing that for a bit, then it's time to evaluate to see. And this is where we combine the data that we showed the model with the data we did not show the model, which is basically our, our um, right answer. And this we can, and thus we can see, on a percentage scale, how good is this model at predicting this? Then we get to do it all over again, because that's the nature of the beast. You can tweak so many settings on the algorithm. You can tweak so many settings on on um, which uh, algorithm to use how to change your data and so on and so forth. This is not a static thing that you do once and just go for it. And what's even worse is that algorithms over time tend to exhibit weird behaviors. This is where you might actually see, um, um, we, we've seen some interesting examples where a, a model that's been running or an algorithm that's been running for, for long enough has started to develop um, some uh, aspects of racism, for instance. So don't for a second think that the module or, or uh, the model or machine learning or AI is without bias. Oh no, it is based on the same principles as the human mind and wherever you find humans, you're going to find bias. So how do we get started? I am so happy you asked. I am going to show you a, um, an example. So back in 1995, a data set with 569 patients were donated to the University of Wisconsin. This data describes characteristics of the cell nuclei present in the image that I'm going to show you in a bit. And the image itself is a digitized image of what's known as fine needle aspirate. This is the, the a result of a um, a biopsy of breast tissue. And we are trying to figure out if what we're looking at is a, a, a cancer or not, if individual cells are malignant or benign is the word I'm looking for. There are ways of looking at a picture like this, especially in radiology. Um, you can actually train a model to do um, do stuff on the picture. But in this case, we're going to go for each and every cell and put in a number instead. We don't need to think very much about oncology. It doesn't matter. We just need to know that these columns represent different aspects or different properties of these cells. There are two columns that we need to take extra care with. That's going to be the first column because that is the patient ID, completely anonymized. And we need to take this out of the equation because if we leave it in, it is bound to completely mess up the patterns. Unfortunately, it will probably find a pattern, but it's not going to be a very good pattern. We also need to take very good care with the second column. That's where you, that's the predictor column. That's where you say M for malignant, which is bad, and B for benign, which is good, a good outcome for the patient. 
And then you have a lot of other um, properties. This is stored in a text file. And I already put the text file into um, Azure storage account. So here we are in the Azure Machine Learning Studio. And it's slightly outdated, but it's, it, it works the same way. We're going to start this by creating a new experiment. I'm going to go with the blank experiment. And I am writing a name. In this case, I'm going to say breast cancer demo. And then you see the canvas. And this is where I'm going to drag items here. There are a couple of ways of doing machine learning. This is the easy version. This is the clicky, clicky, draggy, draggy, to uh, paraphrase Christian Wade of the Power BI team. But you can do it through uh, machine learning um, studio. You can do it through Databricks or uh, different other kinds of ways. And you can do more code or less code. It's all up to you. Then I take my saved data set. Again, it's, it's already stored. And like any good TV chef, I already put it in there. So I drag it out on my canvas. Now it's time to start poking at this data. Remember that I told you that we have two columns that we need to be very careful with. And I'm going to select these columns. And I'm, or I should say that I'm going to select some columns. And I'm going to select all the columns except column one. This is, again, because column one is the patient ID. And I do not want to have that downstream as I keep going. Because it will, in, in, um, it, it will make the algorithm go very, very strangely. Having done that, it's time to split the data. This is where we take, or I should say, set aside some of the data for the training stuff and some of the stuff for the evaluation. Unfortunately, by default, it is a 50%. So it's going to do a 50-50 split. I'm going to change that to 75 because our data set is absolutely tiny. We're looking at 500 odd patients. That's way too small. And I'm going to explain in a bit why that is dangerous as well. Having done that, let's train the model. In this case, I'm pulling out the train and I'm gonna be using the 75% that I took away to do the training on. And I need to explain to this whole thing, what is it that I want to predict? Where do we find the prediction? Well, we find that in column number two. Having done that, let's take a look at the result. We're going to score the model. And we're pulling out a scoring module and taking the result and putting that into. And then we also connect the stuff that we left out from the train module step. This means that we can compare the, uh, the right answer, so to speak, with the result of the train model. Wait a second, we are missing. Yeah, we're kind of missing the brains of the outfit because we have yet to put in an actual algorithm. And in this case, we could go, go for a um, regression or we could go for a classification. In this case, I'm going to go for a classification. And just because I think it sounds awesome, I'm going to go with a two class boosted decision tree. I mean, who doesn't like anything that's boosted, right? Then we press play on tape. I've actually had uh, students and, and uh, audience that didn't know what a tape was. Made me feel very, very old. But having done that, let's look at the scoring. Just right click and visualize and boom. There we go. It looks pretty decent, I think. And as you can pretty clearly see, we have a um, good probability. Everything looks just as I was expecting. Yeah, I can see you just shake your heads through the camera. This is difficult for anyone not trained in statistics to, to read. So let's not. Let's make this go away and we add on another step. And that is going to be evaluate the model. This makes it much, much easier because we are going to add in, a, I was a bit say almost a human element to the whole thing. But we're going to get another visual, and we can have a, a whole different view on the result set. We press play again, 
when we're done, right click, visualize, and now we have a whole different kettle of fish. What can we see? Well, we are now entering a bit of a minefield because when you pull the pin, Mr. Grenade is no longer your friend. And now you're looking at a potential pitfall. Let me explain. Look at the true positive. We have 57 true positive and two false negatives. There are two things that we need to be very, very careful with here. First, what is the definition of positive or negative? This is not a positive or negative outcome for the patient. Look further down because the positive label is malignant and the negative label is benign. So in this case, a positive outcome is a bad outcome for the patient because we have found a potential cancerous cell. When we know that, it's time to look at the other thing. 57 true positives. We're going to find 57 uh, malignant cells. We're going to find one false positive. We're going to find one patient that is flagged as having cancer where he or she did not. I'm saying he or she because you can get a, a, a breast cancer as a male as well. What's worse is we have two false negatives. That means we are completely missing two uh, patients with a potential cancer. That is not a good thing. And in this case, two out of, uh, what was it, some 500 times 75, so maybe 400 people? Mm, not very good. So why did we just get this 0.983 and, and 0.974 score? What the data set is absolutely tiny. We need thousands and thousands and thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of patients in order to get anywhere with this. But it is a good start and it serves to show some of the um, ways to do examples for, for this. And as you can see, I can always go down and look at the raw data underneath as well, should I so choose. That was a very, very quick, how do you do things with uh, Machine Learning Studio? What would be the next step? Well, having that and needing to refine the module, the, the model, this is where we take these steps. You've seen them before, and we're gonna move to and control and, and focus on these because we're gonna train the model again. We're gonna switch out some, some settings on the model. We're gonna train it again. We're gonna do a new evaluation. Did it get better? Did it get worse? And then we keep going. And before anybody asks, yes, you can do multiple algorithms and then compare them to each other. That works fine. But just be aware that this takes time um, and it's gonna take some serious compute. This is why we have, for instance, the N series virtual machines in Azure, uh, where you have um, GPUs, because GPUs are very, very good at number crunching for this kind of stuff. So how can we implement this? Now it becomes fun because we can create a web um, hook, basically a, a web service. And I mean, a web service, you can just go for an HTTPS and, and just ask the web service, or you can put it inside of the most dangerous piece of software ever devised, Excel. There is a great demo on the internet with diamonds because it turns out that um, setting a price for a diamond is not easy. You have a lot of properties that you need to know as, as a, a diamond salesman. And depending on these properties, you get a different price. And just imagine having columns of the different properties and then a column that calls the web service for this machine learning algorithm for every row and automatically gives you a good estimate of, of the price. That's kind of cool, right? or you can use what's known as the Azure IoT Edge. This is cool and also dangerous as heck because anybody ever seen one of these? It's, it's known as a camera. 
that thing actually plays Azure IoT Edge. That means that I can create a machine learning algorithm. I can train it using Azure with ginormous uh, power. And then when the algorithm is done and the model is done, I just stash it into the camera and I can have the camera do, for instance, image recognition without being connected to the internet. That's kind of cool, right? You can also put them in a drone. This is the high-end DJI drone. And on at Ignite a couple of years back, they showed one of these on stage. And they had loaded a machine learning algorithm inside it that could spot damaged pipes. Because I can think of a, a more boring work than just going all over the world, walking the length of piping everywhere and trying to find uh, damaged pipe. This guy could do it in a fraction of the time. And on, on stage, they had a few lengths of pipe. They had a few with some damages. They turn on the drone and they instantly saw and zoomed in on the damaged pipe. And since this thing goes with the GPS, you can know exactly down to the centimeter where the damage had occurred. How can we use these? Well, there was another example shown by, um, I think it was Justina of the Power BI team with uh, machine learning inside of Power BI. That was going to um, looking at hotels in Hawaii. So, I mean, it's it's not hard to plot the um, where the hotels are on a map. That's easy. But how do you go from there to plotting a sentiment because sentiment that is generally people having opinions and how do you how do you plot opinions on on a graph well that's called sentiment analysis and that's where you get a, a score from zero extremely neg negative to one extremely positive for every um, sentence or whatever people had had said in their reviews that's done by auto ml easy inside of power bi premium you just designate one column, I want sentiment analysis on this column, and boom, you get a score. That score, you can plot on a graph. That means that you now know what people thought of a specific hotel. But we don't know why they thought this specific hotel sucked. But if we were to look further, it turns out that a lot of people have actually put in images in their uh, reviews. And again, we have another auto ML feature that tries to interpret what it sees on the image. And then you can correlate the two and realize that a very, very low sentiment score correlates to a, um, an AC on the picture. So top tip, if you wanna have good score as a hotel in Honolulu or, or, or in, in Hawaii, make sure that your AC is not broken, loud, or full of mold. Kind of makes sense, right? You can also use machine learning for quality, quality enhancements. There are many ways to uh, use fuzzy logic and AI stuff to really ramp up um, quality and make sure to, to not need to go in for millions of rows and edit each and every row. Machine learning stuff can help you with it very, very much. Just the other day, NVIDIA came out with NVIDIA RTX Voice, which uses your GPU to on the fly try to take away any weird background noises and it's, it's pretty powerful i'm going to show you two more examples one is from the danish company vestas vestas do wind turbines and i i wouldn't say that i have a, a, an issue with heights but i would not be very happy working as a wind turbine engineer i can say that and it's kind of costly when these things break and especially if they break catastrophically and, and one of the rotors kind of falls off, people are generally, that's generally frowned upon. So what they did was they added microphones and they are recording the sound of the gearbox and basically all the mechanics inside of the, the generator. And having worked with this over several years, they now have a, a um, an algorithm that gives them a good prediction that this gearbox will fail in the next six to eight weeks, for instance, or this sounds funky, you probably need to send out an engineer. So this has vastly decreased the, the need to be on their toes, basically. 
it's much easier to schedule when you know when something's going to fail. And then we have my favorite thing. In 2018, there was a Kickstarter campaign for Stethi. It's out of um, Australia. And Stethi is a Bluetooth stethoscope. And as a paramedic, I can tell you that it is extremely difficult to auscultate, to listen to heartbeat, to breathing sounds, especially if you're in a noisy environment like an ambulance or at an accident scene where a lot of people are upset, they're screaming, um, sirens, God knows what. This makes it much easier for me to hear and see what I'm listening to. It applies some pretty nifty logic to remove unwanted noise and enhance other uh, things that I might otherwise miss. I can also pipe this straight to an ER doctor, for instance, or I could put this into the hands of someone out in basically nowhere. You do not need training to still be able to auscultate and have someone trained help you with an actual diagnosis. I mean, how cool is that? So in summary, machine learning is a tool, just like anything else. Azure is the perfect toolbox because there's so many fun things to do there. And we have only scratched the surface, right? My goal was to give you a primer on what this tool could do. We have done that, and this tool can do so much. And I want to see you go out there and find ways of applying your new knowledge to solve your problems. Because machine learning won't cure cancer. We've seen why in this session. Now, either of you might, with the help of machine learning. Where a screwdriver or a hammer have fairly defined usage areas, we have yet to probe all the full potential of machine learning. It's basically up to you to take this tool, learn its intricacies, and apply it to help solve your problems. You now have a primer on machine learning, but believe me when I say that you ain't seen nothing yet. My name is Alexander, and I thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Alex. Great presentation. Um, we also got some great feedback from the um, attendees. Um, Yanni just said thanks. The subject and the presentation platform is terrific. Um, I got two questions for you um, right away that I was not able to answer on your behalf. Mm -hmm. um, question number one, will you be providing your slides to the attendees? And if so, where would they find them? I I'm yeah sure um, where, where to find them that's a good one let me uh, put them on my uh, web page so uh, www.arcticdba.se that's where I'm going to put them and then there is one question for you that may be easy or hard to answer um, one of the attendees asked you to repeat one of your statements you made rather slowly but it didn't want to interrupt you in your flow so you made a statement about um, the amounts of data and their correlation um, I, I don't know if you so if you could repeat that um, for right so what I said was pretty much the more data you show an algorithm the more likely it is that the prediction coming out of the model will be correct because it's all about finding the patterns and if you show a small amount of data then you might inadvertently miss a lot of the potential patterns so more data better results in 95 percent of the cases all right perfect and i think we got time for one more question and the question from damo is um, is there an option to do this in an on-prem situation if azure or going to the cloud in general is not an option absolutely absolutely people have been doing machine learning on-prem so to speak for for ages but it is prohibitively expensive to do because you need a lot of serious hardware to crunch the numbers at the end of the day this is just math, right? But yeah, you can do this um, on-prem using Spark, for instance. Um, and uh, that's basically what Databricks is. It's Spark's under, uh, Spark underneath. So any, any kind of, of machine learning um, 
uh, toolkit. You can really actually do um, machine learning inside of a uh, SQL Server 20, at least 2019. I think it might be part of 20, 2017 as well. Help, Ben. Uh, so I'm yes, going to answer with a maybe. On. Maybe. Okay, we, we go with maybe. 2019, there is definitely machine learning services inside of SQL Server, and you don't need to be in the cloud for that. No. So um, um, to give a little more context, um, I'm not sure when they've renamed it to machine learning services, um, because, I mean, the R integration started in 2016 and Python came in 2017, and then they've mm. rebranded that whole thing. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure about that. Um, but yeah, well, first options definitely came around in 2016, 2017. Yep. Perfect. So thank you so much again. It was enjoyable as always watching and listening to you. And we'll get ready for our next presenter here, which will be Kathy Keltberger, who will be joining us um, at the hour.